In the spirit of trying to be humorous, even though I'm really not, I'm going to begin by showing you another hilarious cat from QuickMeme.com. In this classic joke we read, what do you do with a dead chemist? Bury him. <laughs> I love it. In our last lecture, we learned a lot about reaction mechanisms and especially rate-determining steps. In this one, I'm going to teach you about catalysts. And what is a catalyst? Well, a catalyst is a substance that changes the speed of a reaction without being permanently changed itself. A lot of research is devoted to finding new catalysts for improving important chemical processes. There are two types of catalysts, a homogeneous catalyst and a heterogeneous catalyst. A homogeneous catalyst is a catalyst that exists in the same phase, either liquid, solid, or gas, as the reactants during the reaction it catalyzes. A heterogeneous catalyst, in contrast, is a catalyst that exists in a different physical state or phase from the reactants during the reaction. For example, the following reaction without a catalyst occurs very slowly. Many different substances can catalyze this reaction, however, including bromide or Br-. Here's how bromide catalyzes the reaction. First, bromide combines with hydrogen peroxide and protons in solution to form dissolved bromine, Br2, and water. Then at this point, this bromine, Br2, combines with more hydrogen peroxide to reproduce bromide, proton, and O2. If we add these two elementary mechanism reaction steps together, we get this overall reaction right here. Okay, I realize that looks really crazy. However, if you cancel out everything that's the same on the left side of this reaction with its counterpart on the right side of the reaction, it simplifies to yield this overall reaction, which is the reaction we started with. You'll notice that bromide that goes in one end comes out the other. In other words, bromide, a reactant on the left side of the equation, is then reproduced as a product on the right side of the equation. So we can say then that bromide is not permanently transformed in this overall process. So what does that make bromide? It makes it a catalyst. You'll notice that the reactant in this reaction is hydrogen peroxide. It's in an aqueous state. Bromide, this catalyst, is also in an aqueous physical state. Because those are in the same states, the reactant and the catalyst, this is a homogeneous catalytic process. Now, as you can see in this energy diagram right here, the catalyzed reaction actually goes through a different energetic pathway than the uncatalyzed reaction. You'll also notice that that pathway is lower in energy. These hills are smaller, which explains why the catalyzed process is easier and faster and requires less energy than the uncatalyzed reaction, which has to traverse this larger hill that's colored in red. And that is a general rule you should remember. Generally speaking, catalysts speed up reactions by providing a different mechanistic pathway that has a lower activation energy than the uncatalyzed pathway. I pause to reemphasize that fact because I have seen questions on standardized exams ask this kind of thing. How do catalysts make reactions go faster? Sometimes these test questions will say things like they change the relative energies of the reactants and the products or something like that. That is not true and it is completely impossible. Whatever the relative energy is of peroxide compared to H2O and O2 is something that you cannot change no matter what you do. The only thing that you can potentially change is the pathway or energy level of the pathway going between these two plateaus. That is what catalysts do. So once again, they allow or provide a lower energy or lower activation energy pathway for reactants to traverse going to products. Or you might more simply say they provide a lower activation energy path than the uncatalyzed reaction. That takes us to a beautiful problem. A catalyst can increase the rate of reaction by doing which of the following? I'll let you read through these, pause the video, and see if you can answer them on your own. Now, I told you earlier there are two types of catalysis. Homogeneous, in which the reactants and the catalysts are in the same physical state, solid, liquid, gas, or aqueous, and heterogeneous. I've taught you about homogeneous, and now I'll teach you about the latter, heterogeneous catalysis. As mentioned, heterogeneous catalysts are ones that exist in a different phase, solid, liquid, gas, or aqueous, from the reactants. One very common process that uses heterogeneous catalysts involves the following reaction, or reactions like it. This is one in which we've got a carbon-carbon double bond. We react it with hydrogen gas, and then a catalyst 
such as palladium, platinum, or nickel. What this does is it places these two hydrogen atoms onto these carbons and converts this carbon-carbon double bond to a carbon-carbon single bond. This process can be used to convert ethylene gas to ethane gas. And it can also be applied to a number of different reactions to convert carbon-carbon double bonds to carbon-carbon single bonds. This is a heterogeneous catalytic process. Why? The reason, once again, is because the catalyst, whatever of these metals you're using, is in a different physical phase, solid, liquid, gas, or aqueous, from the reactants. In this particular case, these reactants are both gases, whereas the metal catalysts are solid. If we look more closely, this is how this reaction actually works. Sitting at the surface of this metal, represented by these purple balls here, you have a molecule of ethene, this gas that has a carbon-carbon double bond, that comes down and sticks to the metal. You then have a molecule of hydrogen gas that comes and sticks to the surface of the metal. Using a transfer of electrons, the metal catalyst separates these two hydrogen atoms momentarily and then appends or sticks them to the ethene gas, which then converts it to ethane with a carbon-carbon single bond, which is then released. You'll notice that in the overall process, the catalyst ends up being the same at the end of the process as it was in the beginning of the process. In other words, it hasn't been permanently transformed. That's why it's a catalyst. You'll also notice that in this case, the catalyst is in a different physical state, solid, liquid, gas, or aqueous, from the reactants. The catalysts are solid, and these reactants in this particular example are both gases. That's why this is an example of heterogeneous catalysis. I want to end by sharing just a really cool example of heterogeneous catalysis. That is the conversion of regular simple hydrocarbons like methane, ethane, propane, and oxygen gas, O2, into methanol. This process is catalyzed using very special platinum catalysts. The reason this is so cool is because if you look at refineries and factories, you'll often see these big smokestacks that have fire coming out the top of them. Why in the world do they have fire coming out the top of them? The reason is because most of those factories have processes within them that are powered or fueled by natural gas. Natural gas is, of course, a gas. What you do with excess natural gas when you're done burning natural gas as a fuel? Well, you could potentially recapture it. However, doing so turns out to be much more expensive than just burning it. So what they do with the excess natural gas at these plants is they just burn it out of a smokestack, wasting all of that energy. And the reason, once again, is because it's more expensive to recapture a gas and try and capture and contain it once you're done using the gas that you've used, than it is to just burn it off. But I ask you, what if you could convert that gas into a liquid? Well, methanol is a liquid. Liquids are much easier to uh, capture because they just kind of siphon off and you can, you know, kind of funnel them into a container. So that's why this process is so potentially cool. If this process were successful, and you could isolate all the excess natural gas once these factories are done with them and convert them easily and simply and catalytically into liquids, you could then reharness those liquids, which are also flammable and can be used as a further energy source. Now, I first heard about this process personally when I attended a research conference in New Orleans back in 2006, given by this guy who's named Dr. Roy Periana, who currently works at the Scripps Research Institute in Jupiter, Florida. Indeed, these platinum catalysts that are being developed to do this are called Periana catalysts, and he's the inventor of them. I'm telling you about the semi-contentious verbal brawl that ensued after Dr. Periana presented his research, we'll have to wait for another time. That concludes this lecture. Please stay tuned to my next one, in which I'll finish this chapter by teaching you about enzymes. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.